Hello all, and welcome back to Tangents on Cracked Spines. If you're new here, I am very glad. We are in the middle of the complete works of H.P. Lovecraft, but we're starting a new book today, or new story today. As a quick intro, I'm Frankie, and we'll be reading with unedited personal commentary and unedited anything <laughs> on the classics or in reality anything in the public domain listener discretion is advised as some of the content holds adult themes and language we are just starting with the call of cthulhu and i never did look up alternate ways to say that so i'm going with how I've heard everybody else say it. Call of Cthulhu. Apparently, this was found among the papers of the late Francis Whalen Thurston of Boston. Uh, oh, sorry. That's part of the thing. Of such great powers or beings, there may be conceivably a survival. A survival of a hugely remote period when consciousness was manifested, perhaps in shapes and forms long since withdrawn before the tide of advancing humanity, forms of which poetry and legend alone have caught a flying memory and called them gods, monsters, mythical beings of all sorts and kinds. By Algernon Blackwood. It was a quote. So this uh, particular story was written somewhere between August and September of 1926 and first published in Weird Ta Tales, Volume 11, Number 2, February of 1928, on pages 149 through 78, and then 287. <laughs> All right, and this is the first one that actually has chapters that we've read for H.P. Lovecraft. Chapter 1. The Horror in Clay. I was debating whether to make this try and do Boston, but I, if I'm thinking too hard, I can't do it. The most merciful thing in the world, I think, is the inability of the human mind to correlate all its contents. We live on a placid island of ignorance in the midst of black seas of infinity, and it was not meant that we should voyage far. The sciences, each draining in its own direction, have hitherto harmed us little, but some day the piecing together of disassociated knowledge will open up such terrifying vistas of reality and of our frightful position therein, that we shall either go mad from the revelation or flee from the deadly light into the peace and safety of a new dark age well that's one way to start a story pretty sure a couple of conspiracy theorists have you know started their manifestos that way would y'all like me to do less commentary and more just reading let me know Theosophists have guessed at the awesome grandeur of cosmic cycle within wherein our world and human race form transient incidents. And I I feel like he was talking about theologians, which is generally the way I've heard that term be. Theosophists. Theosophists? They have hinted at strange survivals in terms which would freeze the blood if not masked by a bland optimism. But it is not from them that there came the single glimpse of forbidden eons which chills me when I think of it and maddens me when I dream of it. 
That glimpse, like all dread glimpses of truth, flashed out from an accidental piercing together. One of these days I will read these without blundering. Flashed out from an accidental piecing together of separated things. In this case, an old newspaper item and the notes of a dead professor. Okay. I hope that no one else will accomplish this piecing out. Certainly if I live, I shall never knowingly supply a link in so hideous a chain. You think very highly of yourself. I think that the professor, too, intended to keep silent regarding the part he knew, and that he would have destroyed his notes had not sudden death seized him. My knowledge of the thing began in the winter of 1926 through 27, with the death of my granduncle George Gamel and... Angel or Angel? You're my angel. Sorry. Professor Emeritus of Semitic Languages in Brown University, Providence, Rhode Island. Professor Engel was widely known as an authority on ancient inscriptions and had frequently been resorted to by the heads of prominent museums, so that his passing at the age of 92 may be recalled by many. Dying in 92? Is that really sudden, though? He lived a pretty darn good life. Or, well, at least long life. Locally, interest was intensified by the obscurity of the cause of death. It was an old age. The professor had been stricken whilst returning from the Newport boat. Falling suddenly, as witnesses said, after having been jostled by a... <clears throat> after having been jostled by a nautical logi... Mm, who... Uh, individual, who had come from one of the queer dark courts on the precipitous hillside, which formed a short cut from the waterfront to the deceased's home in William Street. Physicians were unable to find any visible disorder, but concluded after perplexed debate that some obscure lesion of the heart, induced by the brisk ascent of so steep a hill by so elderly a man, was responsible for the end. At the time, I saw no reason to dissent from this dictum, but laterally I am inclined to wonder, and more than wonder. As my granduncle's heir and executor, for he died a childless widower, I was expected to go over his papers uh, with some thoroughness, and for that purpose moved his entire set of files and boxes to my quarters in Boston. Much of the material which I correlated will be later published by the American Archaeological Society, but there was one box which I found exceedingly puzzling, and which I felt much averse from showing to other eyes. It had been locked, and I did not find the key till it occurred to me to examine the personal ring which the professor carried always in his pocket. Then, indeed, I succeeded in opening it, but when I did so seemed only to be confronted by a greater and more closely locked barrier. Now I have to wonder, does that key mean there was a key ring in his pocket? Or a ring ring with a hidden lock in it. Or a key in it. Bum, bum, bum. <clears throat> For what could be the meaning of the queer clay bas-relief and the disjointed jottings, ramblings, and cuttings which I found? Had my uncle in his latter years become credulous of the most superficial impostures? I resolved to search out the eccentric sculptor responsible for this apparent disturbance of an old man's peace of mind. The bas relief was a rough rectangle less than an inch thick and about five by six inches in area, obviously of modern origin. Its designs, however, were far from modern in atmosphere and suggestion, for although the vagaries of cubism and futurism are many and wild, they do not often reproduce that cryptic regularity which lurks in prehistoric writing. 
and writing of some kind the bulk of these designs seems certainly to be. Though my memory, despite much familiarity with the papers and collections of my uncle, failed in any way to identify this particular species, or even to hint at its remotest affiliations. Above these apparent hieroglyphs was a figure of evidently pictorial intent, though its impressionistic execution forbade a very clear idea of its nature. Well, if you know Lovecraft, that's because the mind cannot understand it. It seemed to be a sort of monster, or symbol representing a monster, or form which only a diseased fancy could conceive. If I say that my somewhat extravagant imagination yielded simultaneous pictures of an octopus, a dragon, and a human character, I shall not be unfaithful to the spirit of the thing. A pulpy, tentacled head surmounted a grotesque and scaly body with rudimentary wings, but it was the general outline of the whole which made it most shockingly frightful. Behind the figure was a vague suggestion of a cyclopean architectural background. The writing accompanying this oddity was, aside from a stack of press cuttings in Professor Angle's most recent hand, and made no pretense to literary style. What seemed to be the main document was headed Cthulhu Cult, in characters painstakingly printed to avoid the erroneous reading of a word so unheard of. The manuscript was divided into two sections, the first of which was headed 1925, Dream and Dreamwork of H.A. Wilcox, 7 Thomas Street, Providence, Rhode Island, and the second, Narrative of Inspector John R. Lagrasse, 121 Bainville Street, New Orleans, Louisiana, 1908 AAS Management, Notes on Same, and Professor Webb's Account. The other manuscript papers were all brief notes, some of them accounts of the queer dreams of different persons, some of them citations from the theosophical books and magazines, notably W. Scott Elliott's Atlantis and the Lost Lemuria, and the rest comments on long-surviving secret societies and hidden cults, with references to passages in such mythological and anthropological source books as Fraser's Golden Bow and Miss Mary's Witch Cult in Western Europe. The cuttings largely alluded to outre metal illness and outbreaks of group folly or mania in the spring of 1925. The first half of the principal manuscript told a very peculiar tale. It appears that on March 31st of 1925, a thin, dark young man of neurotic and excited aspect had called upon Professor Angle bearing the singular clay bas relief, which was then exceedingly damp and fresh. His card bore the name of Henry Anthony Wilcox, and my uncle had recognized him as the youngest son of an excellent family slightly known to him, who had latterly been studying sculpture at the Rhode Island School of Design and living alone at the Florida Lee building near that institution. Wilcox was a precocious youth of known genius, but great eccentricity, and had, from childhood, excited attention through the strange stories and odd dreams he was in the habit of relating. He called himself psychically hypersensitive. But the staid folk of the ancient commercial city dismissed him merely as queer. Never mingling much with his kind, he had dropped gradually from social visibility and was now known only to a small group of... Aesthetes? Aesthet... That's not atheists. Aesthetes. From other towns. Even the Providence Art Club, anxious to preserve its conservatism, had found him quite hopeless. On the occasion of the visit, ran the professor's manuscript, the sculptor abruptly asked for the benefit of his host's archaeological knowledge in identifying the hieroglyphics on the bas-relief. 
He spoke in a dreamy, stilted manner, which suggested pose and alienated sympathy. And my uncle showed some sharpness in relaying, replying, for the conspicuous freshness of the tablet implied kinship with anything but archaeology. Young Wilcox's rejoinder, which impressed my uncle enough to make him recall and record it verbatim, was of a fran fantastically poetic cast, which must have typified his whole conversation, and which I have since found highly characteristic of him. He said, It is new indeed, for I made it last night in a dream of strange cities. And dreams are older than brooding tire or the contemplative sphinx or garden-girdled Babylon. It was then that he began that rambling tale which suddenly played upon a sleeping memory and won the fevered interest of my uncle. There had been a slight earthquake tremor the night before, the most considerable felt in New England for some years, and Wilcox's imagination had been keenly affected. Upon retiring, he had had an unprecedented dream of great cyclopean cities of titan blocks and sky-flung monoliths all dripping with green ooze and s sinister with latent horror. Hieroglyphics had covered the walls and pillars, and from some undetermined point below had come a voice that was not a voice, a chaotic sensation which only fancy could transmute into sound, but which he attempted to render by the almost unpronounceable jumble of letters. Cthulhu Fatal. And I know I'm botching that. I know that there is a general understanding of how this should be pronounced. I haven't looked it up in audible form in quite a while. This verbal jumble was the key to the recollection which excited and disturbed Professor Angle. He questioned the sculptor with scientific minuteness and studied with almost frantic intensity the bas-relief on which the youth had found himself working, chilled and clad only in his light clothes, when walking, when waking had stolen bewilderedly over him. My uncle blamed his old age, Wilcox afterwards said, for his slowness in recognizing both hieroglyphics and pictorial design. Many of his questions seemed highly out of place to his visitor, especially those which tried to connect the latter with strange cults or societies, and Wilcox could not understand the repeated promises of silence, which he was offered in exchange for an admission of membership in some widespread mystical or paganly religious body. When Professor Engel became convinced that the sculptor was indeed ignorant of any cult or system of cryptic lore, he besieged his visitor with demands for future reports of dreams. This bore regular fruit, for after the first interview, the manuscript records da records daily calls of the young man, during which he related startling fragments of nocturnal imagery, whose burden was always some terrible cyclopean vista of dark and dripping stone with a subterranean voice or intelligence shouting monotonously in enigmatical sense impacts, uninscribable save as gibberish. The two sounds most frequently repeated are those rendered by the letters C-T-H-U-L-H-U -H and R apostrophe L-Y-E-H. I know Cthulhu and Raleigh or Raleigh, whatever, but it does say by the letters. So, meh. On March 23rd, the manuscript continued. Wilcox failed to appear, and inquiries at his quarters revealed that he had been stricken with an obscure sort of fever and taken to the home of his family in Waterman Street. He had cried out in the night, arousing several other artists in the building, and had manifested since then only alternations of unconsciousness and delirium. It seems like he was already moving into delirium, so... My uncle at once telephoned the family and from that time forward kept close watch of the case. 
calling often at the Thayer Street office of Dr. Toby, whom he learned to be in charge. The youth's febrile mind, apparently, was dwelling on strange things, and the doctor shuddered now and then as he spoke of them. They included not only a repetition of what he had formerly dreamed, but touched wildly on a gigantic thing, miles high, which walked or lumbered about. He at no time fully described this object, but occasional frantic words, as repeated by Dr. Toby, convinced the professor that it must be identical with the nameless monstrosity he had sought to depict in his dream sculpture. Reference to this object, the doctor added, was invariably a prelude to the young man's subsidence into lethargy. His temperature, oddly enough, was not greatly above normal, but his whole condition was otherwise such as to suggest true fever rather than mental disorder. On April 2nd, about 3 p.m., every trace of Wilcox's malady suddenly ceased. He sat upright in bed, astonished to find himself at home and completely ignorant of what had happened in dream or reality since the night of March 22nd. Pronounced well by his phys physician, he returned to his quarters in three days. But to Professor Angle, he was of no further assistance. All traces of strange dreaming had vanished with his recovery, and my uncle kept no record of his night thoughts after a week of pointless and irrelevant accounts of thoroughly usual visions. Here, he, the first part of the manuscript ended, but references to certain of the scattered notes gave me much material for thought. So much, in fact, that only the ingrained skepticism then forming my philosophy can account for my continued distrust of the artist. The notes in question were those descriptive of the dreams of various persons covering the same period as that in which young Wilcox had had his strange visitations. My uncle, it seems, had quickly instituted a prodigiously far-flung body of inquiries amongst nearly all of the friends whom he could question without impertinence, asking for nightly reports of their dreams and the dates of any notable visions for some time past. The reception of his requests seemed to have been varied, but he must, at the very least, have received more responses than any ordinary man could have handled without a secretary. The original correspondence was not preserved, but his notes formed a thorough and really significant digest. Average people in society and business, New England's traditional salt of the earth, gave an almost completely negative result, though scattered cases of uneasy but formless nocturnal impressions appear here and there always between March 23rd and April 2nd, the period of young Wilcox's delirium. Scientific men were little more affected, though four cases of vague descriptions suggest fugitive glimpses of strange landscapes, and in one case there is mentioned a dread of something abnormal. Well, sounds like sleep paralysis, which I have recently come to understand. It was from the artists and poets that the pertinent answers came. Of course it was the artistic types. And I know that panic would have broken loose had they been able to compare notes. As it was, lacking their original letters, I half suspected the compiler of having asked leading questions, or of having edited the correspondence in corroboration of what he had latently resolved to see. That is why I continued to feel that Wilcox somehow cognizant of the old data which my uncle had possessed, had been imposing on the veteran scientist. These responses from... Give me a minute. Sorry about that. These responses from esthetes told a disturbing tale. From February 28th to April 2nd, a large proportion of them had dreamed very bizarre things, the intensity of the dreams being immeasurably the stronger during the period of the sculptor's delirium. Over a fourth of those who reported anything reported scenes and sounds and 
half sounds, not unlike those which Wilcox had described. And some of the dreamers confessed to cute fear of the gigantic nameless thing visible towards the last. One case, which w the note describes with emphasis, was very sad. The subject, a widely known architect with leanings toward theosophy and occultism, went violently insane on the date of young Wilcox's seizure and expired several months later after incessant screamings to be saved from some escaped Denzian of hell. Had my uncle referred to these cases by name instead of merely by number, I should have attempted some corroboration and personal investigation. But as it was, I succeeded in tracing down only a few. All of these, however, bore out the notes in full. I have often wondered if all the objects of the professor's questioning felt as puzzled as did this fraction. It is well that no explanation shall ever reach them. The press cuttings, as I have intimated, touched on cases of panic, mania, and eccentricity during the given period. Professor Angle must have employed a cutting bureau for the number of extracts was tremendous and the sources scattered throughout the globe. Here was a nocturnal suicide in London where a lone sleeper had leaped from a window after a shocking cry. Here, likewise, <coughs> Here likewise a rambling letter to the editor of a paper in South America where a fanatic deduces a dire future from visions he has seen. A dispatch from California describes a theosophist colony as donning white robes and masks for some glorious fulfillment, which never arrives, whilst items from India speak guardedly of serious native unrest toward the end of March. Voodoo orgies multiply in Haiti. Not sure that's a thing, but okay. And African outposts report ominous mutterings. American officers in the Philippines find certain tribes bothersome about this time. I would think that British or American troops in any foreign country would find the locals bothersome. But, you know, that's only history talking. The New York policemen are mobbed by hysterical... Levantines on the night of March 22nd and 3rd. The west of Ireland, too, is full of wild rumor and legendary... Yeah. And a fantastic painter named... Ardoy Bonan hangs a blasphemous dream landscape in the Paris Spring Salon of 1926. And so numerous are the record... Bleh, recorded troubles in insane asylums that only a miracle can have stopped the medical fraternity from noting strange paral parallelisms and drawing mystified conclusions. A weird bunch of cuttings, all told, and I can at this date scarcely envisage the callous rationalism with which I set them aside. But I was then convinced that young Wilcox had known of the older matters mentioned by the professor. <laughs> Chapter 2 The Tale of Inspector Lagrasse. The older matters, which had made the sculptor's dream and bas relief so significant to my uncle, formed the subject of the second half of his long manuscript. Once before, it appears, Professor Engel had seen the hellish outlines of the nameless monstrosity, puzzled over the unknown hieroglyphics, and heard the ominous syllables which can be rendered only as... I don't know, do you pronounce it Cthulhu, Cthulhu, or, uh, what's the other pronunciation I heard? Cthulhu? I'm going with what all my friends call it. And all this is so stirring and horrible a connection that it is a small wonder he pursued young Wilcox with queries and demands for data. 
The earlier experience had come in 1908, 17 years before, when the American Archaeological Society held its annual meeting in St. Louis. Professor Engel, as befitted one of his authority and attainments, had had a prominent part in all the deliberations, and was one of the first to be approached by the several outsiders who took advantage of the convocation to offer questions for correct answering and problems for expert solution. The chief of these outsiders, and in a short time the focus of interest for the entire meeting, was a commonplace-looking middle-aged man who had traveled all the way from New Orleans for certain special information unobtainable from any local source. His name was John Raymond Lagrasse, and he was a pro by profession an inspector of police. With him, he bore the subject of his visit, a grotesque, repulsive, and apparently very ancient stone statuette whose origin he was at a loss to determine. It must not be fancy that Inspector Lagrasse had the least interest in archaeology. On the contrary, he, his wish for enlightenment was prompted by purely professional considerations. The statuette, idol, fetish, whatever it was, had been captured some months before in the wooded swamps south of New Orleans during a raid on a supposed voodoo meeting. And so singular and hideous were the rites connected with it that the police could not but realize that they had stumbled on a dark cult totally unknown to them, and infinitely more diabolic than even the blackest of the African voodoo circles. I'm going to take that as... Blackest meaning... You know most diabolic and not other means. Of its origin, apart from the erratic and unbelievable tales exhorted from the captured members, absolutely nothing was to be discovered. Hence the anxiety of the police for any antiquarian lore which might help them to place the frightful symbol and through it track down the cult to its fountainhead. Inspector Lagrasse was scarcely prepared for the sensation which his offering created. One sight of the thing had been enough to throw the assembled men of science into a state of tense excitement, and they lost no time in crowding around him to gaze at the diminutive fi figure whose utter strangeness and air of genuinely abysmal antiquity hinted so potently at unopened and archaic vistas. No wrecking nice school of sculpture had animated this terrible object, yet centuries and even thousands of years seemed recorded in its dim and greenish surface of unplaceable stone. The figure, which was finally passed slowly from man to man for close and careful study, was between seven and eight inches in height and of exquisitely artistic workmanship. It represented a monster of vaguely anthropoid outline with an octopus-like head whose face was a mass of feelers, a scaly, rubbery-looking body, prodigious claws on hind and four feet, and long, narrow wings behind. This thing, which seemed instinct with a fearsome and unnatural malignancy, was of a somewhat bloated corpulence and squatted evilly on a rectangular block or pedestal covered with undecipherable characters. The tips of the wings touched the back edge of the block. The seat occupied the center, whilst the long curved claws of the doubled up crouching hind legs gripped the front edge and extended a quarter of the way down toward the bottom of the pedestal. The cephalopod head was bent forward so that the ends of the facial feelers brushed the backs of the huge forepaws, which clasped the croucher's elevated knees. The aspect of the whole was abnormally lifelike, and the more subtly fearful because its source was so totally unknown. Its vast, awesome, and incalculable age was unmistakable yet not one link did it show with any known type of art belonging to civilization's youth, 
or indeed to any other time. Totally separate and apart, its very material was a mystery. For the soapy greenish-black stone with its golden or iridescent flecks and striations resembled nothing familiar to geology or mineralogy. The characters along the base were equally baffling, and no member present, despite a representation of half the world's expert learning in this field, could form the least notion of even their remotest linguistic kinship. They, like the subject of material, belonged to something horribly remote and distinct from mankind as we know it. Sorry. Something frightfully suggestive of old and unhallowed cycles of life in which our world and our conceptions have no part. And yet, as the members severely shook their heads and confessed defeat at the inspector's problem, there was one man in that gathering who suspected a touch of bizarre familiarity in the monstrous shape and writing, and who presently told with some diffidence of the odd trifle he knew. This person was the late William Channing Webb, professor of anthropology in Princeton University and an explorer of no slight note. Professor Webb had been engaged 48 years before in a tour of Greenland and Iceland in search of some runic inscriptions which he failed to unearth, and whilst high up on the West Greenland coast had encountered a singular tribe or cult of degenerate Esquimo. Esquimo? Whose religion, a curious form of devil worship, chilled him with its deliberate bloodthirstiness and repulsiveness. I'm pretty sure it's only allowed to be called devil worship if they recognize the god that goes with it. It was a faith of which the Esquimo knew little, and which they mentioned only with shudders, saying that it had come down from horribly ancient eons before ever the world was made. Besides nameless rites and human sacrifices, there were certain queer hereditary rituals addressed to a supreme elder devil, or Tonasuk. And of this, Professor Webb had taken a careful phonetic copy from an aged Angakok, or wizard priest, expressing the sounds in Roman letters as best he knew how. But just now of prime significance was the fetish which this cult had cherished, and around which they had danced when the aurora leaped high over the ice cliffs. It was, the professor stated, a very crude bas-relief of stone comprising a hideous picture and some cryptic writing. And so far as he could tell, it was a rough parallel in all essential features of the bestial thing now lying before the meeting. This data, received with suspense and astonishment by the assembled members, proved doubly exciting to Inspector Lagrasse, and he began at once to ply his informant with questions. Having noted and copied an oral ritual among the swamp cult worshippers, that's a thing, swamp cult worshippers, his men had arrested, he besought the professor to remember as best he might the syllables taken down the amongst the diabolist Esquimo. There then followed the exhaustive comparison of details and a moment of really awed silence when both detective and scientist agreed on the virtual identity of the common phrase to two hellish rituals so many worlds of distance apart. What, in substance, both the Esquimo wizards and the Louisiana swamp priests had chanted to their kindred idols was something very like this. The word divisions being guessed at from traditional breaks in the phrase as chanted aloud. Finglui, Meglanov, Cthulhu, Raleigh, Veganag, Fatang. And I did, during my pause, uh, look up how to pronounce it, and I still am just like, I get, I, 
Um, tongue twister. Too many consonants. Legrasse had one point in advance of Professor Webb, for several among his mongrel prisoners had repeated to him what older celebrants had told them the words meant. This text, as given, ran something like this. In his house at Raleigh, dead Cthulhu waits dreaming. I didn't know the dead could dream. <laughs> and that's where we'll end for today. Dead Cthulhu waits dreaming. Thank you all for listening. And for some typical podcast business, if you enjoyed this, please subscribe, rate, or review on whatever uh, podcast listener you're using. It helps other people find me and join the book club. And, you know, just be honest. You like it, you don't like it. I'm happy to hear it. And also share with your friends. Because if you like it, I'm sure they do too. Anyways, you can reach out to me via email at talkspod at gmail.com. That is phonetically Tango, Oscar, Charlie, Sierra, Paris, Oscar, Delta at gmail.com. On Facebook at Tangents on Cracked Spines Book Club or with a voice message at anchor.fm forward slash Tangents on Cracked Spines. I will let you know if that changes considering Anchor is now Spotify for podcasters. Um, the Facebook page will have you know, updates uh, posted and, you know, tells you what I'm currently reading outside of this podcast and also allows you to vote on the next story. If you're interested in merch, I have made a few items uh, in my personal Etsy shop, which I'll link in the description if I remember. Thank you all again for listening and have a wonderful day, my bookworms.